Adam, it's so great to uh, to chat with you. Um, we chatted briefly a few days ago, so I got to know you a little bit, but um, it's so great to uh, sort of talk to you about this um, this book, which I um, I read last weekend. And, uh, you know, I realized that after reading it, like I'm the perfect person to moderate this conversation, you know. <laughs> but I... Um, let me just start with like the obvious question. Cause I know you, cause I'm a dad. So I know you as the guy that wrote the book, go the fuck to sleep. Um, so this feels like an obvious trajectory to this, this <laughs> book. Why write a book about a golem? Like why, well, what, what, what was the, where did that come from? Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's great to be here and it's great to be here with you. Um, and, you know, we're moving in the right direction because my first event for this book was at a Presbyterian church. So we're getting like there you go. <laughs> a little more on brand as we go, you know, um, three months from now, I'll like get interviewed by an actual Jewish person. Maybe uh, we'll see. <laughs> Probably the goal of tonight is not to convert you. We don't do that. That's not how we get down. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, uh, most people, as you say, do know me for go the fuck to sleep. Um, but you know, I I have I was a novelist before that, and I'll be a novelist uh, long after that. Um, it's already long after that. It's been I don't know twelve years since I wrote that book. Um, I had been thinking for a while about golems. Um, I wrote a book in 2019 that I was at the Y for actually with my co authors, Dave Barry and Alan Zwy Bell called a field guide to the Jewish people. And it was a Jewish humor book. And although it was a humor book, I did a lot of research, um, largely because Dave and Alan refused to do any. And one of the things I researched was golems, I already knew a little bit about golems. There aren't that many creatures in Jewish folklore. The golem is certainly the most interesting of them. Um, for those who don't know, a golem. Yeah, let's is... uh, explain it for the goys in the in the. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Um, all right, here we go, goys. You ready? Um, a golem is a creature, a humanoid creature, nine, ten feet tall, made of mud or clay, brought to life through secret incantations and prayers and rituals, always by a rabbi or a very learned man, always at a time of crisis, a time when people are trying to kill the Jews, which to be fair, could be almost any time in our history. But the legends of the golem date from the 1500s. Um, the golem is always brought to life at a time of crisis, and it does its work, it does its job. Part of bringing it to life involves writing the Hebrew word for truth, on its forehead or on a piece of paper that's inserted into its mouth. And after the work is done and the Jews are at least momentarily safe, the golem is returned back into its state of being mud or clay by erasing the last letter of the word, the Aleph from its forehead, uh, turning the word truth to the word death and turning the golem back into clay. Mm. Um, I'd always been intrigued by this, right? I mean, it's fundamentally a pretty interesting idea, this sort of supernatural clay monster that defends the Jews. You can, of course, see in it the sort of primordial idea that would lead to things like Frankenstein's monster um, or even modern superheroes, yeah. many of which were yeah. written by Jewish writers. Um, right. But, I, you know, I was toying for a long time with sort of the, the comic premise of a golem that was created by a guy who was not a rabbi or a learned man, a guy who was really just some schmuck and who was creating a golem not out of some immediate crisis, but for kind of no reason or kind of like out of boredom or by happenstance. And in my mind, this would be a funny premise. This golem would come to life and like start screaming at him in Yiddish, which he wouldn't understand, start breaking stuff. So I was sort of, I sort of had this idea in mind, but like, you know, that's not a novel. That's like a Saturday Night Live skit, um, the kind of skit that's funny for four minutes and then goes on for like another four minutes. And you're like, how are they going to wrap this up? Mm -hmm. um, and separately from that, I'd also been toying with another idea for a novel that had to do with epigenetics, had to do with the idea that trauma can be can enter the DNA and be passed down from generation to generation. 
Mm. Science increasingly is clear that this is the case. And I had this big sort of sci-fi premise about epigenetics and trauma and the transplanting of traumas from one individual to another and just all of the kind of like political ramifications that would occur if trauma could be both pinpointed and proven and traded. Isn't that, like isn't that actually in the book? That story that you originally had, you sort of find a place for it in this book, right? Yeah. The novel about epigenetics that I couldn't figure out how to write becomes the novel that my protagonist, Len Bronstein, couldn't figure out how to write and right. is actually in the first chapter of the book. Yeah. Um, what got me writing, though, was the realization that the golem, that I could turn the figure of the golem from the mythology into something totally new by making him a creature who has an ancestral memory, who isn't made but remade. In other words, there's only in this book, there's only ever been one golem. So the same creature with the same consciousness is made and unmade, made and unmade. So thus he becomes kind of like this walking repository of Jewish history and Jewish trauma. And of course, he's only been brought to life at like the gnarliest moments in our history. So he's particularly traumatized. So when I realized that, I was like, okay, that's a novel. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So did you did you worry about the because, I mean, the golem is a quote unquote real thing that people, you know, have has existed in Jewish mythology. So were you worried about the idea of turning that on its head or or because your golem is not like I mean, I did a little research on golems and your golem is not like any golem in history. You know, like I, I mean, the idea of him being profane you know he, he shows up and the first thing he says is like where's my dick you right. know were you were you worried about that at all in terms of like how you were going to approach this thing that was you know sort of sacred for lack of a better word i mean asif do i look like somebody who would be worried about having a golem say where's my dick <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't, I wasn't worried. <laughs> Honestly, what I was worried about, what I wanted to make sure was exactly as you say, that no one had done this before. Because a lot of stories about golems have been written. Right. But the, as, as soon as I realized, like, okay, nobody's ever done a golem who has this kind of ancestral memory, whose history also goes back to the beginning of time, essentially, not to the 1500s, which is when the mythology starts, I, I began to feel very good about it. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't too worried. I mean, I think mythology exists, particularly today, but kind of always. Mythology exists to be flipped and reinvented. Um, so many contemporary writers in all mediums are playing with the canon, the Greek gods, the you know, like whatever the whatever the whatever the mythology is. Like all of our stories, in some ways, are built on this common trove of mythology, and I think it's always. If you can figure out an original way to flip um, a, a figure like the golem, then, you know, I think you're usually on safe ground. I wasn't particularly worried about making him like a, a, a profane, shit talking, aggressive asshole, because um, that's probably how I would act if I was nine and a half feet tall, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, now, did you. You you said that when you wrote your other thing, you did a lot of research uh, because Dave Barry and and who else you wrote it with didn't do anything. Alex Wiedel. Do you do, are you a, are you a writer who does a lot of because there's a lot of research in this book? I feel like there's a lot of Jewish history and 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 history of the Hasidic community and and all. That. Are you a person who like? starts with a lot I mean, when you got this idea then we're like okay i gotta go research all this stuff because you're weaving in a lot of different it's not just about a golem you mm -hmm. know there's a lot of stories that you're weaving into this uh, and some of it is sort of the politics of, of brooklyn and the hasidic community and stuff so did you do a lot of research into that i did yeah um i'm the type of writer who in general, I like to research as I go. Like I don't do all of the research and then all of the writing. I sort of write until I need to stop and research something, take a quick break, do that research. But that said, I actually came into this project 
having done a bunch of the research necessary already for previous projects, particularly around the Hasidic community. Um, my friend and yours, Danny Hawk, and I had a TV project that we were developing that was sort of like succession among a Hasidic community, like a power struggle, a succession struggle. We did a bunch of research. I did a bunch of research and I carried that forward into this project. So um, I did do a lot of research. And as you say, there's a lot of, because this golem has this ancestral memory that allows me to go backward and forward in time and tell a lot of kind of like standalone stories about his long history, his long existence. So, you know, there's a chapter in fifth century Babylon in which the Golem encounters the figure of Lilith. There's one in 11th century Cordoba where he is made by a stable hand during the so-called um, golden age of Spanish Jewry, which more appropriately might be called like the slightly less shitty age of Spanish Jewry. Um, but, you know, I, I sort of knew enough about a lot of the stuff going in that I could do very directed research. Like I knew that there was an interfaith academy in Spain at that time, and that a project of translation of all the world's texts from Greek, Ara Aramaic, Arabic, Hebrew into like, I knew that that existed. I knew Jews were prominent in that because we had lived under empires that spoke all those languages and we were natural translators. So we were like brought into this, like I knew all of that stuff. So it's not like I had to sit there and Google, like, were there Jews in Spain? I could Google like, you know, or look up or research. I don't want to imply that I just Googled stuff, but I could like get very granular and specific. Um, you know, eventually in this book, Len and the Golem and the other main character, Miri, make their way to Kentucky to attend a white nationalist rally. I, I did a lot of very sort of specific directed research about very small details, like what are the various costumes and uniforms and attires that these disparate groups of white nationalists wear? How do you tell one from the next? How do they distinguish each other? Like stuff like that. Um, you must be getting amazing uh, pop-ups on your computer now. <laughs> oh man, yeah, they don't know whether they don't know whether I'm coming or going. They're like, this first, this guy's googling like Kabbalistic notions of, this, <laughs> and then this white nationalist. Yeah, yeah. They're like, uh, did you? I mean, you know, there's obviously not to give away the story, the book for people who haven't read it, but you know, like you said, they do go to this this um, rally, this white nationalist rally in Kentucky, and and. You know, clearly there are the echoes of Charlottesville in all of that, you know. So was that a big influence? Is that is that how you got to the point of like, oh, this is because now the golem is here. OK, what's the crisis? Yeah. I mean, even in the book, they're like, well, there's no what is the crisis? And so is that were you always going to go there to the, the sort of Charlottesville of it all? Or how did that how did that occur to you? Yeah, I did always intend I think even as early as, you know, the day that I woke up, realized that this epigenetic thing could tie into this golem thing and wrote like a four page outline of the book. Even in that early document, they do get to a white nationalist rally. I did know that that was the death. Um, and I, you know, the, the also the idea, you know, just to talk briefly for a second more about the idea of a crisis, because already people are like, you know, how can your character say there's no crisis? Jews are under attack, da 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 da. To be very clear about the nature of the type of crisis for which a golem is summoned, we're talking about like a, 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 an active shooter situation. You don't summon a golem because like people hate the Jews. You don't summon the golem out of a sense of vague existential danger. You summon a golem, you make a golem, you bring a golem into existence because like the Cossacks are riding down the mountain or the villagers have lit the torches and are marching toward your part of town. So when Len is like, I don't know, there's no real crisis, that's the state of mind he's in. Um, but eventually after a bunch of adventures, um, after the golem is sort of bouncing around town, is appropriated for one thing and this thing and this other thing, out of a sense of frustration and out of a desire to kind of reclaim the golem, this woman named Miri, 
who uh, grew up in a Hasidic sect, left at 18 because she's gay and that does not play in that world, and has basically been on her own ever since, and is recruited by Len to translate for the Golem when he only speaks Yiddish before he learns English by binge watching Curb Your Enthusiasm after ingesting 50,000 uh, doses of LSD. Um, eventually out of sheer frustration, she's like, you wanna know what the crisis is? Here's the crisis. And she shows him a video of the Charlottesville Unite the Right Tiki Torch Nazis. And she's like, there, those guys, they're trying to kill the Jews. And the Golem is like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like, where are those guys? Right. I need to meet those guys. Right. And as luck would have it, you know, there's another march of a similar nature called the uh, Save Our History's Future rally um, around the removal of yet another, like, you know, racist statue in, the, in, in Kentucky. Um, in this case, a statue of a, a, a judge, a notorious judge who was known as the hanging judge um, is being removed and the usual suspects are, ga are gathered to rally against this and against you know, the worldwide Jewish conspiracy that caused this statue to be taken down. So right. the Golem demands to be taken there. Um, so yeah, I, I did, I think I did always intend for the Golem to face off against white nationalists. Um, and you, do have, you do have a real face, like it delivers, again, not to give it away, but like it delivers, I'm gonna give it away. It delivers on that, you know? And, 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 and I, it was funny because I was reading it, I was sort of, it sort of echoed of like sort of the revenge fantasy that existed in Inglorious Bastards, you know, like the kind of was that something that you were thinking of? Like, you know, because he does sort of play right into that sort of. Um, yeah, that fantasy of, of 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 taking heads off of bodies and stuff and just killing these guys, you know. Um. Yes and no. I mean, I think. I think the concerns of a film like Inglorious Bastards, which is a good movie. And the concerns of many, many Tarantino movies are to figure out a solid moral justification to unleash tremendous cinematic violence. Like, I feel like he's ultimately more interested in the spectacle of violence and stylistically filming it and doing a great job than he ultimately is in the reasons he just, he's like, all right, who will everybody agree we can murder with moral impunity? Um, Nazis is good. Slave owners is good. You know, I feel like that's his agenda. I'm less interested in like the volume of carnage. There is some carnage, but at no point was I like, the golem is going to kill everybody. That's how we're going to play it. We're just going to spend chapters watching him like slaughter and slaughter again. I'm I'm more interested in kind of the moral quandary that the Golem and Len and Miri are ultimately faced with. Let me um, fair, you bring that into it as well, into it, the the moral quandary, which is Len is like, you can't just kill people. And and Miri sort of goes on a bit of a journey because she initially is like, yeah. And then when she sees them, she's like, kill them. You know, yeah. so there's kind of, it's interesting how they both arrive at, at sort of a, an opposite ends of that spectrum by the end of it. Yeah, they do. They begin in very different places from each other. And I think they end in very different places from each other and from where they originally started. Um, you know, and a lot of it, I think, ultimately has to do and can be distilled in a, in a kind of simple formulation. Um, and I'm sort of resistant to answering the question. I'm much more interested in raising the question. But I think the question goes something like, we can kill all the anti-Semites and be safe for once. But if we do so, we may no longer be Jewish. Like we may have committed an act that is so morally distant from who we are, who we are intended to be, that it almost renders us no longer those people. It's like, if that's how we save ourselves, do we even exist anymore in the manner that is worth saving, that is worth preserving. And this is sort of where Len and Miri end up. And they end up in a discussion of the concept of tikkun olam, which is a very central, important Jewish concept, which is basically repairing the world. And Len uses it to explain to Miri why he can't unleash the golem to just slaughter everybody. He's like, what happened to tikkun olam? We're supposed to repair the world. And Miri is like, dickhead. 
have you ever thought that maybe this is how we repair the world? And that's sort of the distillation of like where they stand um, with the golem as this um, unbeatable weapon who is going to be either deployed or not. Right. Um, we have a few questions uh, that I'll I'll just read to you. I, I have not vetted any of these questions. So um, this was submitted to us earlier. Are there any other Jewish folkloric or biblical characters, creatures that you encountered in your research for this book that you left out of this work but are considering writing about next? Oh, man. I love this question. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so many. And, you know... I did a very, I did and am currently doing an extremely foolish thing, which is I started writing a sequel to this book. It doesn't make any sense right. to write a sequel to a book that hasn't come out, that nobody's bought, that maybe nobody will buy. But I felt like I had more to, you know, the great thing about the Golem and the thing that'll ultimately be my downfall is that the Golem is this renewable resource, right? Even if he, you know, he's like a comic book character. Like there's, never, a, fr there's a franchise here for yeah. sure. I, like I, I, never, I yeah. speak in Hollywood language, you know. There we go. Like they're, you know, they're never dead for long. They can always be resurrected. So even right. if the golem is no longer uh, animate at the end of this book, there's nothing to say he can't be. So, yeah. Um, so in, in that sequel, I'm dealing with Dibbuks and Ibers, which are fascinating folkloric concepts. Um, a Dibbuk is a restless, malevolent spirit that takes over a human body. This is like the Jewish form of possession. There's some movies. I think there's a, 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 a new movie, an old movie, both called the Dibbuk. Dibbuks are fairly well known. Um, there's also something called an Ibber, which is basically the same thing. But instead of being a restless, malevolent spirit that takes over a body, it's a righteous spirit that returns to earth and takes over a body for like some noble purpose, which I feel like there's a lot of gray area here. Like, wouldn't you assume that like every Dybbuk thinks that it's an Iber, you know, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> you know, you, you would think that all the Dybbuks are like, what are you talking about, man? Relax. I'm an Iber. I'm, and you're like, no, you, you just destroyed that poor person's life. You know, no, I trust me. I got a plan. Um, I, I think Dybbuks and Ibers are fascinating. I've worked those into this thing. There's also just a lot of historical figures who are not necessarily magical or supernatural or mythological, but that's a that's a porous line in Judaism, right? Like if you read the Talmud, as I am currently doing, which is a whole other story, um, you'll find even in the like little tiny biographies of the rabbis that accompany the text, these very casual mentions of like incredibly supernatural, bizarre things. You know, the Talmud is often like a book that is dry and about law and about rabbis arguing about the absolute tiniest minutia of like divorce proceedings. But then you'll read the bio and you'll be like, you know, like so and so was also known to have great sway with the angel of death and be in regular contact with the prophet Elijah. Or you'll read in the bio like he was so holy that buildings waited until he had left to fall down. And you're like, what is going on here? So there's, you know, this very thin line or non-existent line in Jewish history and lore and even some something as canonical as the Talmud separating like the sober realities of law giving from the supernatural adventures of people who could prevent buildings from falling down by their holiness. So, right. yeah, it's, it's a lot of material and I'm committed to uh, <laughs> working with as much of it as I can until somebody stops me. It's interesting. What is that? What What do you think that's about? Like this idea that like there is such a what you said, which I think is really interesting. There's a porous line between sort of the reality of of uh, and and the kind of earthboundness of of what it is. The time and then this are, are these characters, um, the, the 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 people, not the characters, but the people in the in the Talmud. Are they, are they um, is it a, is is it a is it what is that about? Like that there's a kind of porousness into another sort of more supernatural world. What do you think that's? I think that to me, one of the things that's really fascinating about Judaism as I study more and more of these texts is there's a real duality between 
the earthbound practical nature of it, the totality of the system of law that is created and consecrated in the Talmud in particular, the interpretation of law as it exists in the Torah, in the Mishnah, by the Talmud, by later books as well. Um, between that and between the spiritual aspects, the, 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 the presence of God everywhere. And it's, it's easy to forget when you're reading something like the Talmud and, and a lengthy discussion of like whether you can contract a sub agent as well as an agent to de deliver a de to your wife. And if she's standing on a rooftop, can you throw it over the parapet to her? Well, it's only considered delivered if it, um, you know, like depending on like whether she catches it on the updraft or the downdraft, this makes like a legal difference. Like this incredibly minute, almost ridiculous level of scrutiny because and, and then you remember that the reason for all of that scrutiny, the reason for all of this like litigiousness is out of the absolute fear of getting anything wrong because all of this is about your relationship to to the almighty to the divine it's all about showing and living and proving on an hourly on a minute by minute basis your devotion so they don't always read like dervishes or like ecstatics but in a sense they are it's just filtered through this very particular relationship with text but as these guys stand before the torah they are every bit as like ecstatic every bit as mystically entranced every bit as sort of one foot in this world and one foot in another as anybody any anybody you know as as montaigne or as hafiz right in their own way that's what these guys are doing if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, I have another question for you that came in. Uh, what is the strangest or most surprising piece of Jewish history that you learned writing this that you had no idea about? Mm. Um, well, first, I should say that one of the things I tried to do in this book in writing these mythological seeming chapters was invent stories around the golem out of whole cloth that were intended to feel like they were ancient like they the story about the golem and lilith in in the fifth century in babylon or the story of the golem in the caliphate of cordoba i want them to feel like they've always existed i want them to feel like i didn't make them up like i'm just retelling them so even in this book the line between fiction and history is intended to feel a little bit porous and blurry um, I think the research I did, and this isn't exactly history, it's more mythology or um, theology, I guess, but the history of Lilith as a figure, as a demon, her evolution in Jewish folklore, and her folklore, of course, extends into other faith traditions as well, but the idea of Lilith as the first wife of Adam in the Garden of Eden, who refused essentially to be subjugated refused to be considered lesser than him, said, hey, we're created at the same time, we're equals. Um, this action, this refusal, essentially turns her into a demon. She then flies away across the ocean, is pursued by angels who are instructed to destroy her. Lilith stops in midair, at least that's in my imagination, and basically turns to them and speaks the true ineffable, unknowable, unspeakable name of God that has never been spoken before or since. And this prevents her destruction and turns her into this other thing. She's no longer a woman, but a full fledged demon, a killer of babies, a seducer of men like this figure, this creature. Um, that was really interesting reading about that and reading about the different iterations of her over time. Which part did you make like, you know, I mean, which part did you make up in terms of like, it's not in the in the mythology itself? Is the her turning around and speaking the name of God? No, that part is in the mythology. Um, ah. And it's interesting because, you know, in some sense, just like the golem, she's a creature created out of the power of words. And for that matter, 
in the Torah, the world itself is created out of the power of words. So there's this way in which the Golem and Lilith and everything and all of us, you know, were these creatures that aren't just powerfully connected to, to words, to stories, to books, the Jews, of course, as the people of the book, but are literally created from words and the manipulation of the alphabet. And I found myself riffing on this theme a lot in different ways. The story in Cordoba is a good example. Um, the notion of an unknowable name of God that can be sought after using various means. You know, there's, there's one that involves the manipulation of three verses in Genesis that all have 72 letters that give you this like incredibly long name of God. Um, there's the Tetragrammaton. There's all of these wild like linguistic formulations all in pursuit of this ineffable, unknowable being. Like that's a central idea. Um, yeah. and it extends even further into the mysticism. Um, and that, that extends, I think, even beyond Judaism, you know, because I, I know as a Muslim in Islam, we have, uh, there are so many names of God that you cannot say all of them kind of thing. Yeah. You know, that, and so there's this idea that that there is a, an unattainableness to the divine, like you can't quite get there. But the Lilith character is really interesting. I mean, that could be your sequel, the Golem and the Lilith, like, yeah. you know, but, <laughs> but the Lilith character is interesting because it, it's such like, I mean, clearly... A, a, a feminist sort of like you know character who uh, you know um interestingly is is portrayed as a demon um you know which is it's a complicated problematic sort of character in, in today's world right definitely and lilith has been sort of reclaimed i think as a feminist icon and a a hero instead of a villain in this book you know she makes a very brief appearance my approach is to kind of defang her and make her almost like a wandering spirit who is incredibly feared. The story involves somebody who um, lost a kid, attributes that loss to the incursion of Lilith upon his home because the incantation bowl that is supposed to prevent her from coming in, and this was a real thing in fifth century Babylon, you bury this incantation bowl with images of Lilith, other demons. He digs it up and finds it broken. He's like a low level rabbi and a bit of a schmuck. So he builds a golem to defend his home during this sort of liminal period between the birth of his son and the circumcision of his son eight days later. The kid is super vulnerable during this time. And he sets the golem to guard his home. And eventually Lilith shows up, but she's like not what she's supposed to be in any way. And it's like very kind of vexing and perplexing to the golem um, who's been standing there like killing ostriches and random creatures that like <laughs> might be Lilith all this time. And then she actually shows up in the flesh. Um, if you could, there's another question here that came in. If you could only pick one, who is your ultimate Jewish comedic influence mm. to the others? I mean, you do have... Uh, Larry David has a big part in this book. Yeah. You know, because the golem does learn how to speak English from Kirby Enthusiasm, uh, as many yeah. of us did. Uh, as, many, <laughs> as, as really all of us have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Larry, uh, David, uh, Larry David plays a big role in the education of the golem. And then because he's this trusted figure, at a certain crossroads in the book, when Len, Miri, and the golem are on their way to Kentucky. And Len and Miri begin to get very nervous. They're like, what does he actually intend to do? And they stop the car, they have a sidebar discussion, they stop the car and they confront the goal. And they're like, look, um, what's the plan here? When we get to this rally, you're just gonna scare them, right? And the golem, whose English is a little shaky, um, he, he, uh, he calls himself the golem. He doesn't use a lot of definite articles. He's like, no, the golem gonna kill everybody. And they're like, uh, that's not good for the Jews. Please don't do that. Right. The golem won't listen. The golem's like, I don't think you understand. Like, this is my job. And they're like, you got to not do that, please. Like, who will you listen to? You won't listen to us. Like, will you listen to, will you listen to Walid? Walid's a friend of Lens who the golem likes a lot. Will you listen to Uncle Josh? Will you listen to Larry David? And the golem's like, might listen to Larry David. 
So they managed to like cold call Larry David's agent and get Larry David on the phone in the middle of this parking lot in West Virginia. They're suddenly Zooming with Larry David, who's appraised of the situation. Right. And basically like, Larry, this golem here, they show the golem, the golem's like, what's up? Larry, like he's gonna kill hundreds of anti-Semites. You're the only person who can talk him down, please. Larry David's like, nah, he should kill as many as possible. <laughs> Larry David's like fully on board with this. Um, it's so, a great yeah. scene. It's a great. It's a great scene in the in the book, you know. And uh, are you do you know Larry? Do you know Larry at all? I know Larry a bit. Um, Larry was kind enough to read the audio book for one of my obscene fake children's books. Um, okay. yeah. And so I never met him. But the reason I never met him, I, I feel like. I feel like what I did was a very Larry David move. So I feel like he's got to respect it. I was on Martha's Vineyard, which is also somewhere Larry David, you know, tends to be. And, and Larry was in LA and he was going to record the audiobook. And the publisher was like, hey, can we fly you to LA so you can sit in on the session and like direct? And I was like, nah, I'm not leaving Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> I feel like that would be something Larry would do. So I was like, all right, all right, Larry, balls in your court. Um, Larry is a very dear friend of my frequent co-writer, Alan Zwei Bell. Uh -huh. it's, through, it's through Alan that Larry read this audio book. Um, I tried to get this book in Larry's hands um, pre-publication. So he's he has he gotten this book? Has they sent it to him? Yeah, 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 he's got it. I don't think that he's read it yet. Larry's a busy guy, you know, um, but we made every effort. Um, but to not answer right your now, question. Not, not right now, by the way, he's not busy right now. Yeah, 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 maybe not right now. Yeah, he's, he's, busy gonna, busy right now. He's, he's busy holding a picket sign someplace. Right, yeah, exactly. um, who is my greatest comedic Jewish influence? Yeah. Um, it's such a good question. I mean, um, you know, Lenny Bruce comes to mind as kind of like the the old school king. But like, you know, I mean, there's so there's so many answers. Um, I think Jackie Mason, when I, I like I will I will go and just listen to Jackie Mason albums right now. And they're 50 years old or something. And they're brilliant. They're incredible. Like Henny Youngman is like incredible. You know, like I'm teaching my kids Henny Youngman jokes and they're killing in like preschool. You know, um, I also think that there are a lot of Jewish novelists who are funnier than people realize. Like, people don't think of Bernard Malamud, for example, as being funny, but that's because they're not reading the funny Bernard Malamud books. The last book Malamud ever wrote, which he wrote like right before he died, is this book called God's Grace. It's about a Jewish guy who's a, a, a scientist. He's on a boat doing like deep sea research. He dives down into the ocean. While he's down there, there's a nuclear apocalypse. So when he comes up, he's the only man left on Earth. The only other living creatures are these research animals who are on the boat. A chimpanzee, a handful of baboons, and like a talking uh, gorilla. And he goes to this island and tries to reform society with this handful of talking, with this talking gorilla and these other random primates. Wait, That's a talking gorilla? Yeah. There's been an operation, maybe it's a chimpanzee. There's yeah. been some kind of operation performed on this animal and it speaks English. Uh -huh. And like, again, like Bernard Malamud, oh yeah, like, you know, the assistant, the natural, but also like he wrote this crazy shit. Um, he's very funny. Uh, the Tenants is another Malamud book that's extremely funny. It's kind of his like book about race. It's about a black writer and a Jewish writer and it's kind of bananas. There's a movie of it starring Snoop Dogg, which was not the best casting choice. Um, I'll ask another question here that came in. Will Samuel L. Jackson be doing a dramatic reading of the goal in Brooklyn, of Brooklyn anytime soon? That must have been a big thrill to get Sam Jackson to, I mean, you had Larry David do it as well, but but Sam Jackson was so perfect for, uh, I think he, that's how I found out about your book, Go the Fuck to Sleep. Yeah, Sam, Sam was great and Sam, Sam remains great. And I've been, really lucky to be able to collaborate with him on something like a consistent basis. You know, he did go the fuck to sleep. The great thing about a book like Go the Fuck to Sleep is that it's so short that things happen super fast. So like on Tuesday, they're like, 
hey, Sam Jackson's going to narrate the audiobook. I'm like, oh my God, great. You know, 45 minutes later, they're like, he did it. It's done. He's, you know, like, um, you know, and, and that led to, that opened the door to us doing uh, an Obama ad in 2012. It led to us doing a COVID PSA called Stay the Fuck at Home. It led to us, it led to me then getting to direct him in a Biden ad. Um, when Sam and I collaborate on a presidential ad, the Democrats are undefeated. And it is unfortunate that we skipped a cycle. Right. <laughs> um, what do you have now? I mean, this book is out, right? It came out, it came out Tuesday? Yeah. Great. Um, what else do you have cooking in the, like in the next, what, what, what is going through your head right now that you want to write about? Um, you know, I mean, speaking of like political ads, which became kind of a, a, a side, a sideline of mine, um, I ended up writing and in some cases directing a bunch of political ads and different kinds of PSAs and comic videos. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the ads that I want to do for the 2024 election. Um, if for no other reason than it, that it, it, that it helps me feel like I'm not completely useless as we wait to see if the world is going to burn or burn like faster or slower. Um, so I'm thinking about doing some more work in that realm. Um, I am working on this next novel, um, and I'm no longer on strike as a screenwriter. So a number of projects in that realm that have sort of been treading water for the last 150 days or so. Um, hopefully we'll get back on track. Um, I'm also, yeah, I'll, I'll, that's, a, that, that's enough. <laughs> no, that's a lot. That's great. Um, well, thank you. This is, uh, this has been a great uh, conversation and I, and I hope that, uh, people will go out and get the book. It's really fun. And it's, it's, it's a wild, it's a wild ride. It's, it's definitely, uh, and, and, and I, and I, as somebody who like came to this with absolutely no historical knowledge of, of the, I was actually calling it the Gollum. And then everyone kept saying to me, no, that's from Lord of the Rings. Like It's, it's pronounced Gollum. I mean, like almost everything else about Judaism, there is no widespread agreement on how to pronounce Gollum. Right. Right. I pronounce it this way. I'm adamant about it. I'm lucky that the audiobook matches up to my pronunciation, but just like literally every other aspect of the religion, nobody agrees on this. Was the Gollum and Lord of the Rings sort of inspired? I guess it wouldn't be because it, it doesn't have anything. But I'm, I'm curious why they even use that name. Do you have any? I, you know, I don't have any insight into it, but I know that Tolkien was such a student of all of the kind of mythologies of the world. It seems impossible that he wasn't aware of the Gollum. In terms of why he chose that, I mean, you could argue that as Gollum from Lord of the Rings sort of loses more and more of his autonomy and his humanity to the ring and the kind of power of it, he becomes Gollum-like, perhaps. You could, you could, I could see that maybe, but it might be a little forced. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's so interesting how, you know, we talked a little bit in the beginning, you were talking about like this idea of the golem being almost like uh, the um, the sort of ancestor of a lot of the the superhero mythologies that now are, are so abundant in our in our culture. You know, um, he's sort of like the first superhero, um, I think, you know, uh, and, 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 and like Superman sort of came out of that, you know, lineage in some ways, and then was like, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of co-opted by rah-rah America, sort of, you know, nationalism kind of kind of stuff, uh, pro-democracy and all that stuff, you know. But it yeah. did, it, it feels like it came out of, like he was, he was kind of the first, I don't think there was ever a, a character like that prior to the Golem. Am I right in thinking that? I think... I think I think that you're right that a lot of, you know, I mean, we know that um, the golden age of comics, the silver age of comics, a lot of the most important creators behind these titles, whether it's uh, Superman or the Fantastic Four, which features features the thing who is not 
Yeah. Not only canonically Jewish, shout out to Ben Grimm, the thing, but very golem like in some ways. A lot of these creators were Jewish. They were probably aware of the mythology. Um, and the, you know, the, the importance, particularly in like post war America, the resonance of like an unbeatable protector figure probably felt more important than ever. So drawing on the golem to create characters like the Hulk or Superman or the thing, it makes a lot of sense. It sort of lines up. Um, in the story, though, the story is you you have there's a moment in the story where you talk about the golem um, during World War II um, and, and during the Holocaust, and then um, he's destroyed, if I'm remembering it correctly, and then that's the last time that you ever hear from the golem until this moment when your character um, is that the last time that we ever encounter the golem in, 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 in Jewish, Jewish mythology? No, that's something I invented. Um, <laughs> you know, stories of the golem really are mostly 1500s, 1600s, aside from the more modern creations of, you know, novelists, but it made a lot of sense to me. So in the book, the last time the golem has appeared on earth, he was part of the Babanyar massacre um, in the Ukraine in 1941, during the first part of the war, the first part of the Holocaust, what's called the Holocaust by bullets, which was, you know, before the Nazis set up camps in this incredibly efficient system of annihilation, um, large groups of Jews were routinely massacred. And one of the first and largest was the Babanyar massacre in which 33,000 Jews were systematically killed by German soldiers and thrown into this massive gorge in the Ukraine um, over the course of 36 hours. So in the book, the golem is created by the Grand Rebbe of a, of a, of a Jewish community and is machine gunned to pieces and falls into this gorge along with all of the other victims. And in some, and that's the last appearance that he makes in the history of the Jewish people in the book. And this makes some sense to me because the intimation is that when you are suddenly confronting death and annihilation on this scale, this horrific, mechanized, gigantic scale, the usefulness, the efficacy of a 10-foot clay crisis monster ceases to matter. It's almost like he becomes irrelevant in this moment and is destroyed and sort of passes out of the consciousness of the people, only to return 80 something years later with no memory of the Holocaust. So one of the first things that Len and Miri have to do when the golem stops tripping on acid and reliving his past is explain the Holocaust to him because he has no memory of it. Now, you that's an interesting question. That's an interesting point because you said he does have ancestral memory, but, but you chose to give him no memory of the Holocaust. Why? Well, because he dies in 1941 and is never made again, Di you know, dies. He's he's destroyed in 1941 and no one made him again until now. So it's just not something he lived through. He has an ancestral memory, but only of the moments during which he was animate. I, I try not to use the word alive. Right. Because that, right. Alive. right. But yeah, he just he wasn't there. He wasn't there. The last thing he remembers was 1941 was being machine gunned to bits. Um, so he just, he doesn't know. He doesn't know where he is. You know, he comes to life and is like, what country is this? Smells like Prussia, maybe, you know, he, he just doesn't know. Um, so yeah, they've got to explain it to him. Yeah. Okay. I can't let you go without um, telling the story of the, the dolphin. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Do <laughs> you don't have to? You don't have to. It's I just, mean, look, I you, you it's in the book. Like, it's in the book, so it's fair game. And yeah. you know, everybody who's listening to this podcast has gotten this long. Maybe they found us charming and interesting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> surprise, we're disgusting. Um, there's You're a story. Like, where's the dolphin the story? <laughs> there's a story in the book that this character Walid tells. Um, I'm not going to explain why he tells it. I'm just going to tell the story. But I'll say that this is a story that for a while I was telling 
during all my like Hollywood general meetings when people were like the real story, by the way. This 100%. is this, this is all true. This is not one of your made up things. No, no, this is real. That's this what I love about it. And, and surprisingly well documented. Yeah, you know, as you know, you go on these general meetings and people are like, is there any IP? Are there any stories? Has there been a magazine article that you're dying to adapt into a movie? So after like a long day of these meetings or a long week of these meetings, I started telling this story just to like see what reactions I would get. The story basically is, is this. Um, in the 60s, the conventional thinking in biology was that brain size correlated to intelligence and therefore whales and dolphins might be super intelligent. And there was this one guy, Harvard trained biologist who really, really believed this very deeply. He even wrote this like sci-fi novel where dolphins learn to speak English and have a seat at the UN and stuff like that. And he set out to try to teach dolphins to swim, uh, to, to swim, to speak English. And he set up in Hawaii. And one day this local girl comes and she's like, I heard you were here. I love dolphins. I love animals. Can I help in any way? She's like, sure, you can like, you know, feed them some fish. You can hang out, whatever. She very quickly establishes herself as extremely good with the animals, better than anybody else, better than his research assistants. So she's working with this one adolescent male dolphin and trying to teach it English. And she goes to the guy and she's like, listen, he's not making progress as quickly as I think he should. I think we need something more intensive. And the guy's like, I agree. So they put her in a house, an actual house with this dolphin. The, they fill the house with like four feet of water. She sleeps on a raised platform, but otherwise she's just waiting around in the water, speaking English to this dolphin all day. All day long. All day long. And it's not going well. The idea is that he's going to see her as like a, a, a mother figure and learn from her. But instead, he seems to be distracted by his own impending puberty. He like can't focus. So she goes to the scientist and she's like, listen, this dolphin is distracted by his horniness. And I think that I should like start giving him hand jobs every other day or so. The scientist is like, I couldn't agree more. So she starts giving the dolphin hand jobs. Meanwhile, it being the late 60s, the scientist gets really into LSD and its transformative potential. And he decides that the dolphin should also be regularly dosed with LSD. So now this dude, now this dolphin is living in a house, <laughs> flipping his balls off and getting regular hand jobs from his human girlfriend. And this goes on for months, months. And eventually some other researchers show up at this research station, see what's going on. And they're like, oh, hell no. And they shut everything down. She like leaves. The scientist, I think, like keeps his job somehow because he's, you know, a white man. Um, and like, and the experiment's over and she, she leaves. And sadly, you know, dolphins are voluntary breathers. And the dolphin is so distraught that he basically stops breathing and if in effect kills himself. Wow. Which is, but the story has an even weirder ending, which is that years later, this woman moves back into this house, which is now not full of water, and raises her kids there with her husband because this house had such beautiful memories for her. I think that's- Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> I mean, that's our closer. That's, <laughs> we can't top that. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. This was a, uh, so interesting, insightful, sort of, you know, disgusting a little bit, uh, <laughs> uh, disturbing. But uh, uh, I want to recommend everybody uh, to go out and buy the book. It's it's great. And uh, you'll have a great time reading it. And that dolphin story is in there, too. Yes. Among other great stories. <laughs> among many far less. Among, among many. It's, it, yeah, it's a lot of things, but it's yeah. it's great. Uh, um, Thank you so much, Asif. You didn't, you know, you you didn't have to do this, and you really didn't have to ask me to tell the dolphin story, but <laughs> I really appreciate it. Listen, it's it's uh, you know, uh, it it it's, it is it is. Whenever you do these things, I recommend you close with the dolphin story. <laughs> I'm going to take that to heart. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Congratulations on the book. Thank you.